our sexual rights declaration is unique. That declaration was made by the governing council of IPPF and it has been circulated all over the world with the reach of millions and millions of people. We felt it was really important that it would stand up to international scrutiny as a human rights document. So the linkages between the fundamental human rights, the right to life, the right to, to education, the right to freedom of speech, all of those rights, we then grounded it in issues around sexuality. Our main goal was to move the Federation towards this new concept and to provide the member associations in the local uh, fields with uh, a document that they could use to advocate for sexual rights. The individual worker is confronted with the fact that, hey, you know, if I'm concerned about this person who has a physical disability, rights, then why am I not concerned about somebody who is gay, who can't get services at our organization, or who can't get a job because their sexual orientation is in question. In terms of sexual rights and human rights, women are denied not only their choices, but also the control of their body. My rights have been compromised, particularly when I was married. You don't have to say no when your husband asks you to, to have sex. So it's almost like, you know, you are told you are the one who is being, who has to obey. Then the actual violence, where some say culture demands that you train your wife, you deal with your wife almost as a child that you have to train yourself and beatings and nasty things being done to women is still something which is very, very important. It prevents them from enjoying their sexuality and their sexual rights. Gender-based violence is any act or threat of physical, sexual or psychological aggression against a woman. It is a human rights violation and one of the most serious public health problems worldwide. According to the World Health Organization, one out of every four women reports having been a victim of sexual violence perpetrated by an intimate partner. Nunca pensé que me podía suceder una situación de este tipo y la sufrí durante ocho años. Ocho años de mi vida en las cuales yo estaba acorralada a pesar de todos mis, 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 mis estudios o mi preparación. We have to mobilize young people so that they demand it. So in my region, in the South Asia region, um, early marriages has been a very big issue. Girls are married at a very young age, and it's, it's, it's a continuous process. It's even happening now. Amar naam hosna, amar bosh choddo bachor, baba amar biye thik korachan. বিয়ের পর তাদের প্রায় সবাইকে লেখাপড়া ছেড়ে দিতে হয়েছে বিয়ের রাত নিয়ে আমি অনেক গল্প শুনেছি আর এটা নিয়ে আমি খুব ভয় পাচ্ছি If a girl gets married early she loses out on education she loses out on becoming a productive member of the community of society and she also has children early and she is not able to get the choices in life which are rightfully hers this is complete denial of, uh, of human rights of every kind. Well, with the issuance of the Declaration on Sexual Rights, uh, IPPF uh, in the Arab world region was able to work on two particular important uh, problems we have. One of them is on child marriage, and the other one is on combating uh, female genital mutilation and cutting.
mutilating women is a way of wanting to control their sexuality. Now that is a violation. It's a myth that it's a, a, a religious requirement. In fact, it dates back to being an, a pharaonic custom. One of the things that's happened in Mauritania, for instance, the member association there really activated their work on female genital mutilation. As a result of that, they've changed their laws. The right to privacy is very important to me. As a gay man, I wouldn't imagine how a country is going to police two consenting adults in their own bedrooms unless they are going to invade their privacy. If we have sexual rights addressed as human rights, then we don't get all the prejudice and stigma on dealing with sexual rights uh, in terms of sex. Because in my country, if you talk about sexual rights, people think you're talking about sex. The situations where trafficking occurs the most is often where uh, the workers are, you know, the most exploited with the least of rights. You know, it's like undocumented migrants or, you know, the sex industry or industries where you have no rights actually and you have no way to, to go to the police and, and, and report crimes against you. Trafficking that leads to coerced sex work and trafficking that leads to forced marriage that, in the end, is a sexual rights violation because it takes away the element of choice. The individuals are violated, there's a lot of sexual violence, and at the same time, the element of choice is taken away from them. in extremely homophobic situations where the law is very punitive and, and not only is the law as is written punitive, but the society is punitive as well. It has given member associations the courage to actually find strategies for acting even in those things that is within the law of the land, but which helps to provide services for people who need it. I fled Jamaica on January 10th and after my marriage to Tom was made public since then, I've started receiving a steady stream of death threats. But I hope one day, this vortex of hate will end, and I can once again return to the warmth of my amazing country. In the context of LGBT in my country, many persons are, sim are abused because of their expression, how they manifest their, their orientation. I've been accused of being or sounding too gay. For that, I'm exposed to harassment and violations. Friday night in Mancini, in Swaziland. There's a good chance that several of these young people are HIV positive, as a quarter of all adults here are living with HIV. For HIV AIDS transmission, what we did, it was a, like an entry point to try to integrate 
you know, these linkages, SRH and HIV AIDS, so that the stigmatization will disappear. And we did it successfully in most of our MS, uh, our member association. So when you go to a clinic, for example, you are going for SRH services, so there is no stigmatization saying that, oh, you are HIV positive because of this integration. If you look at Central Asia, where our member associations are also quite afraid sometimes to talk about sexual rights. In the middle of the region, there you have Georgia, European Georgia, who have been working with uh, the stigma index that IPPF has developed and have actually worked actively with uh, people living with HIV AIDS. Uh, so also looking at their rights, and that has been a huge success in the country, in a country where it's not that uh, evident or easy to do that. Young people are not considered as bearer of rights and they are not considered as sexual. And this combination of this perception of young people as not being sexual and of not, being, not having rights, not having human rights, is deadly. If young people don't know about their rights, they get into very dangerous situations. Uh, they, they engage in risky behavior, unsafe sex, un, um, un, unsafe activities. And what happens is the, the consequences of an early marriage or uh, a pregnancy or finding out that uh, your sexual orientation doesn't follow social norms affects them a lot. It affects their self-esteem and their chances for education, their chances for having a, a, uh, a good relationship. Namaku Halimah, umurku 17 tahun. Aku belum menikah dan aku adalah seorang ibu. Aku tumbuh di desa pertanian kecil sama keluargaku dan sekolah di sana. E, seperti remaja lainnya, aku punya pacar, tapi dulu aku nggak tahu gimana cari informasi tentang seks. Sama keluarga, aku nggak bisa ngobrol yang begituan. They don't know that they're being oppressed. They don't know that they're losing a fundamental human right for them. So uh, it it uh, continues the problem. My name is Sylvia and I'm a woman living with HIV. I remember shortly after my diagnosis, I was going through this terrible period of shock, but obviously one of the first thing at the forefront of my mind was, can I have children? So I remember I asked a doctor in a hospital here in London, in South London, and uh, you know, the doctor looked at me and kind of just rolled her eyes, like, you know, she didn't say, you, you know, you cannot have them, but everything in her body language said, why would you? My partner and I, it's also in the future, we were once in Amsterdam Airport, and we got off of the plane, we get met by the people who are meant to help us get from gate to gate. And then particularly guys said, you know, you know, what's your name and what's his name, my partner. And because we both have the same thing in me, he said, oh, so you must be brothers. And we, and we said, no, 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 we're married. You get people who can't get their head around the simple fact that two disabled men could be gay and could be married to each other. It was some pretty depressing. You know, the most important thing is to start with individuals, you know, to understand and learn about sexuality can be done at families in schools 
and to influence and advocate, you know, for governments to come up with laws which are friendly, you know, to one's, you know, sexual development and sexual understanding. Uh, when we initiated this project, you know, even ourselves, you know, we did not actually uh, think that it was going to get roots as it is getting now, because um, since homosexuality is not, I mean, it's not, it's forbidden in Cameroon, we thought probably uh, it's going to bring us problems. But with the advocacy we made towards the government and other high place authorities, I think they themselves are also buying the idea. Very, very recently, the network of women living with HIV in Namibia took the government to court because they were carrying out uh, forced st sterilization on HIV positive women. And what basically was happening was that when, uh, when women were giving birth, like during labor, they would make them sign a consent form to be sterilized because they were HIV positive. And you can imagine, within that frame, in that frame of mind, you're in labor, you're not really in the position of giving an informed consent. My dream was that we would constantly make progress and that you see uh, laws being changed and uh, sexual rights being taken into account. But recently we see a lot of uh, backlash. Uh, many countries are actually uh, you know, doing, cutting down on legislation, making life difficult for people. Uh, so I think I'm ready to get on the barricades again because it's really getting very tense in Europe. When I grow up, I want to have a backstreet abortion. I want to be killed because I'm gay. I want to be raped because I'm a woman. I want to be killed by my brother because my family says I've dishonoured them. Young people, I think we really cannot you know, lose one second of attention for that area. I think the battle is at all levels. It's at the policy level, it's at the implementation level, it's at the service delivery level. It's also attitudes about in the communities, it's the attitudes of, of the community gatekeepers. So it's really working at di different, different levels. And I think IPPF is able to do that because of the very nature of the way we are. We bring in the evidence from the field, from the community. We are a community-led, volunteer-based organization, and we are also able to do the advocacy at the global level, and that our advocacy is informed by the work that we do in, in the community. IPPF um, is advancing sexual rights at the global level, and we're doing this through the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism of the Human Rights Council. Um, and that's a process whereby each of the world's 193 member states of the United Nations um, has their human rights record reviewed once every four and a half years. What we're trying to do is make sure that when a country comes up for review, our member association is there, ready to advocate. The violations ranged from the sexual rights of sex workers, the sexual rights of uh, gays and lesbians, the sexual rights of young people, and this is very new for the UN because the traditional human rights, they were civil and political rights and they uh, were not uh, referring to the sexuality of anybody. So far, there's been something like 19,000 recommendations using the Universal Periodic Review process. It's over 60% of those have been accepted. You hear some people saying that, oh, you know, in Africa we have other challenges such as hunger, such as uh, poverty, such as uh, shelter, such as uh, uh, natural crisis, and you want to focus on sexual rights. I know it's not easy, but sometimes we don't link it. They don't make a kind of linkage between the sexual rights and the other uh, issues they are raising. I think that we need to establish a dialogue with faith-based organizations who are not totally against the issues. I think that we have to find where we have common ground, work on it. And the final analysis is really about, about supporting our humanity. Sexual rights are basic human rights. They have to be respected. <laughs> <laughs>